Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, glad to see you all here on this you know, bright, cold January Friday morning. I'm Johanna Nesseth, and I'm with CSIS. I'm Vice President for Strategic Planning, and I co-direct our new project uh, on US leadership and development, which is really focused on looking how, at how the private sector is engaging in development activities, and especially on economic development. Uh, my first love is food and agriculture. I uh, head up our food security work, and so I'm really delighted to be able to kick off this year's Chevron Forum with a very special conversation about the type of partnership that is really at the heart of what we're doing in our development work. Um, today we have with us uh, Tara Acharya. Um, Acharya, Tara Acharya with PepsiCo, and Nancy Roman with the World Food Program. Um, we're going to talk about a relatively new partnership that WFP and PepsiCo have put together that absolutely embodies the type of approach that I think will take us into the future of development. Um, Ethiopia is a partnership that they've put together to help to raise the production of chickpeas in Ethiopia in order to help farmers to raise their incomes and their productivity level, to help World Food Program and PepsiCo uh, have new products and new uh, production that they can use in products, and then ultimately uh, to help with the processing and manufacturing so that WFP actually has a very nutritious and useful uh, product in their feeding programs. It's a tremendous partnership and uh, really has a lot of momentum going and a lot of opportunity. As we've been talking this morning, it's not without challenges. So I think what we want to do today is just hear some about what they're doing together and how uh, how they've approached it and what some of the hallmarks are, but also hear about what the challenges are of this type of partnership. So with that, welcome to you both. Thank you for spending time with us this morning. Just so you know, we are recording this program so that uh, it can be webcast and people can take a look at it uh, on our website. Um, so I want to start just by asking you both to just lay out what you're doing with this partnership. What is it? How does it work? And really talk about the story of how it got started, because it's, uh, it started at a very high level and with a big bang. So <laughs> if I can turn it over to you, maybe Nancy, you want to start. Sure. Well, thank you, uh, Joanna. I'm delighted to be here. This is one of our most exciting partnerships, and uh, I think it's really important to talk about it and to share experiences uh, as we go. <clears throat> well. I love the way this partnership actually began because Derek Yak of PepsiCo and myself both serve on the Global Advisory Council to the World Economic Forum. And so in November, not last year, but the year before, we were in Dubai with that Glo Global Advisory Council meeting on what really were the cutting edge food security issues that the world should take up. And after one of the sessions, Derek and I were sitting in the lobby talking, and I was telling him at the time there were floods in Pakistan. I don't know if you remember that. But I was telling him about this very cool product that we have. It's in a, a packet like this. And it was a, something we were just making made out of chickpeas with uh, dried milk, lipid-based, super fortified with vitamins and minerals specifically to address undernutrition. And I was saying you know, how effectual it was in the floods, but that it was a shame that you know, we didn't have enough capacity. We couldn't scale up. And so there was a nutritional need that wasn't being met. And Derek said to me, well, that's incredibly interesting and coincidental because we have just decided as a company to not only move more of our portfolio into nutritious foods, but to really try to develop the chickpea as a base product and to you know, work with the chickpea across Africa, one, because Africa grows chickpeas, two, because it's this super nutritious base product, 22% protein, lots of iron. So we began talking and, you know, and realizing that PepsiCo was go going to need chickpea demand really across the income pyramid. So they already had an existing business model where they would be taking you know, high end and, and exporting to uh, Europe and US hummus, and middle of the plate to India and Pakistan. But then we, I think we really first began, but what about the bottom of the income pyramid? And you know, I like to say, capitalism breaks down for the poorest of the poor. So you have these, I'm a, I'm a big capitalist, but you have need in some of these hardest places, nutritional need, but you really can't even test supply and demand. 
because you don't have the supply, because you know companies aren't you know producing it. So we just started to brainstorm about how one plus one could be greater than two. You know they were they wanted to ramp up production of the chickpea. Uh, you know we had this chickpea product. We understand a lot about these countries because of the work that we do. The United Nations World Food Program is in 74 countries. So we started talking about it, and very quickly, um, it was two months later, we were then at the World Economic Forum with an MOU signed by the, president, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Meles, uh, the CEO of PepsiCo, the head of the World Food Program, Ross Shaw, the head of USAID. And as I, I say, Tara very quickly he joined in. We took then in February a trip to Addis Ababa and right away began you know, implementing on the ground. Uh, so it's come together quickly. <coughs> Tara, tell, tell us from your perspective, what, what were some of the uh, beginning discussions and why was this such an important effort for you? So from PepsiCo's perspective, as, as Nancy was mentioning, um, chickpea was already a very interesting ingredient from us, particularly from the perspective of nutrition but also from the perspective of environmental sustainability because as you know it's a it's a legume so it's it's actually a nitrogen fixing crop and it's uh, it uses relatively low uh, resources such as water and so ag from an agricultural perspective it was an interesting crop for us as well and perhaps for the audience just to set the context uh, you know Indra Nui has said in in many um, uh, external fora that at its heart, PepsiCo is really an agricultural company. So if you, if you, th I, I think for many people when they think PepsiCo, they usually just think Pepsi Cola. But, but PepsiCo is a little bit broader than that. So some of our major brands include Lay's as well as uh, Lay's and Doritos and all those associated products, um, but also Quaker Oats and uh, Gatorade and Tropicana. And so. We do have very close relationships around the world with our contract farmers. And furthermore, we have a deep interest in expanding our offerings to, to consumers in sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, and the opportunity then to work with the World Food Program was particularly intriguing and exciting uh, for our senior leadership, and particularly for visionary leaders within PepsiCo like Indra Nui and several of, of her uh, senior leadership um, because it offers us the opportunity to then reach beyond the one billion consumers that we do reach today in the world and start exploring how we can bring better, more nutritious um, products to consumers um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but also what was really wonderful about this partnership was the opportunity to work from the ground up. So we were, really, uh, we were really intrigued by this idea that we could work with um, uh, farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa to boost their supply of chickpea and then use that chickpea to produce uh, nutritious products that could then help them um, uh, improve their health status. Uh, and so that combination of both the health uh, and nutrition as well as the agricultural supply was, um, a, was really motivational for us. And that's what I think we, we try to achieve that in many other parts of the world as well. But I think where we, uh, where we faced a challenge in sub-Saharan Africa was that we don't have a lot of experience in that mm -hmm. geography, whereas the World Food Program um, has a deep and, uh, and broad experience across the world. And we felt that it was uh, particularly advantageous for us from the private sector to work with an agency um, that is as influential as the World Food Program. I, I want to just um, stay on those points for a couple of minutes because I think you have both highlighted a couple of things that are really hallmarks of public-private partnerships, especially in the ag and, and food space. There is an enormous market to be served in food and agriculture. Companies are able to reach new markets. They have, in many cases, very low dollar products that people can actually afford. But a number of companies, and, and there's a lot of growth in this area. There's a lot more demand. But companies, I think, oftentimes have a tough time figuring out exactly how do we operate in these new markets. So for you all, it was really a strategic priority to, to have this partnership, in part to understand how these markets work. Right. And maybe you can say a couple <coughs> more words about that. 
Right. I, I mean, I think that we, we have begun to explore exactly what you're talking about, exploring new innovative business mm -hmm. models in geographies such as India and China mm -hmm. and Brazil. Um, but I think for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it's a slightly different mm -hmm. ballgame because, it, and particularly in Ethiopia, it's a different ballgame because these are not, uh, you know, these are not consumers that have been exposed to a wide variety mm -hmm. of products. And so we have very little understanding from the mm -hmm. private se sector perspective of how those consumers would behave were they faced with such a product. Mm -hmm. So what we've actually done with the World Food Program is, um, is a slightly different take, if you like, on, on the commercial perspective. PepsiCo Foundation has supported the World Food Program mm -hmm. with a grant of three and a half million dollars, whereby the, f the, the um, World Food Program is actually going to uh, take the lead on product development and optimization, and, um, and as, well, as well as testing uh, the product in the market. And they're going to do this, and this is, this is the piece where I think it becomes really interesting. The World Food Program is going to do this in partnership with a local manufacturer. And so what we're hoping is that we as PepsiCo are going to uh, develop some learnings about how consumers react mm -hmm. to such products, how they, um, uh, you know, how they adapt their consumption behaviors, but not through a commercial business for PepsiCo. Mm -hmm. You know, from, from, from that perspective, I think we, we felt that this is a great learning opportunity for us, but it's also a great opportunity for a local manufacturer mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. establish a, a profitable business for themselves, while at the same time helping to meet the World Food Program's objectives. Mm -hmm. This is a, it's an interesting point, and I always think that we give very little thought to how much effort goes into getting that little bag of Lay's into our vending machine or to our table, that there's an immense amount of research and marketing research and testing. And there's also a huge amount of quality control that goes into creating products. And World Food Program, you spent a lot of time on this and have a lot of expertise. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how, how you're managing that and how you're bringing to bear some of these um, some of these tests and approaches that uh, Tara is talking about. Okay, <clears throat> sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. But before, I, I really want to mm -hmm. touch on your broader point, which I think is a critical one. You know, food companies right now are moving into the developing world mm -hmm. because they, the market in the developed world is not completely saturated, but certainly more saturated. There's enormous opportunity. And the decisions those food companies make, I think, will just be fundamental to the way the world is nourished. These are big decisions mm -hmm. because, to your point, they, consumers at the bottom end of the market, and to your point, yes, they will buy low price products, but what are their offerings? And unfortunately, one of the painful realities is the more nutritious food is, usually the more expensive it is to produce. And so the reason that there's so much junk food that's hovering at the edge of these markets is simply because it's cheaper to produce. Uh, so that's one point I wanted to make. And it takes courage for companies, and some are doing it, to say, listen, keeping price point in mind, how can we be as nutritious as possible as we move into these markets? And I have to applaud Indra Nui's leadership for the way PepsiCo is thinking about that one point. Um, the other point that I think is really, really important for the audience to understand and appreciate is that while, again, I'm a capitalist and I like the fact that companies sell products and earn money, and I think there's nothing to be ashamed of about that, but it's very important to understand that PepsiCo will not profit for the sale of the product at the bottom end of the income pyramid. And those conversations were long and there were many of them on the ground in Addis Ababa about how do we get <laughs> to this issue, um, <clears throat> you know, because of course companies rightly want to, you know, be testing products that will be at that place in the market, but we were talking about the poorest of the poor, the hungriest of the hungry, and for PepsiCo to be profiting on that, you know, with the foundation was very complicated. So the, if the, there will be a profit made by local Ethiopian manufacturers. Some of the testing that you know, we've been doing in December, we were you know, looking at different local Ethiopian manufacturers about which would be best and most likely, frankly, to come in at the right price point. Because the other point I wanted to make, this will be a global good. 
Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is not something um, that we will try to own and patent and keep to ourselves. We want this global good to be available for other United Nations agencies, NGOs, to really help nourish you know, the very, very, very bottom of the pyramid. So it's an interesting structure, and I think you know, it took courage on Pepsi's part to sever itself you know, from the profit portion of it at the bottom end. It's very important you know, that you understand that. As far as the quality control and so forth, I mean, you know, there's a many decades of history mm -hmm. in understanding nutrition, but the thing that's most exciting that has gone on, and I think many of, of, of you are aware of it, but is the understanding most recently about what happens to a child's brain and body in the first 24 months of life. Um, you know, it used to be, I like to say, you know, when I was a girl in the 60s, we were helping feed hungry people out of compassion. We felt it was the right thing to do. We didn't like to think of people being hungry. Now we're doing it because, wow, we get it. There's so much more at stake than compassion. You know, if a child receives the right nutrients in that fundamental window in the first 24 y months of life, their, you know, frankly, their potential for IQ is different. Their body's immune system is different. I will send around here, you know, this is something you can't see from there, but I would like you to be able to see it's the brain scan of two three-year-old children, one who's normal and one that's been malnourished, <coughs> and on the back side are the, the neurological synapses, and you see how different it looks, uh, the picture of a child that's been nourished and a child who hasn't. So to your points about testing, I'm not the best person in to get into all the technical aspects of it, but we've built on a lifetime of experience and learning about the vitamins and minerals, fundamental and necessary to prevent, to prevent malnutrition. The product where there's two. Could you show them an example? Yeah, yeah sure. You know, it, it won't look like this in package because it's not branded, but I, I wouldn't mind passing this around too, Renee, because you can sort of feel what it feels like. So it's a little bit like a sweet hummus. If you imagine it's got chickpeas, soft, so that a young child can ingest, you know, lipid-based, milk protein, and vitamins and minerals that have been formulated. And we are, you know, looking again for maximum formulation, because what we want this to do is to prevent malnutrition rather than to treat it. We don't want it to get mm -hmm. to the treatment mm -hmm. stage. We have a different product to treat it when a child's already at death's door and so much of the damage has been done. That's important work too, and UNICEF also is involved in that work. Uh, but no, we're all about trying to stop a child ever from getting there. So that's what we've been, you know, testing, and that's what we'll pilot, you know, when this new, newly formulated product rolls off in the summertime. Can you send so these? So I, I yeah, have to add that, you know, early on in the discussions, um, Nancy, you and your team, you shared these samples with us, and I'm from India, so I tasted that. Yeah. And it's perfectly formulated for South Asia, I have to yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very familiar taste yeah. to me. Yeah. So, so the, and the idea yeah. is that if you've got a little two or three year old who's off, um, who's off uh, on an actual diet, they just open it up and they eat this little mushy stuff. It's sweet, so they like it. It's packed with protein and fat and is really enough for a full meal. Is that yes. about the right portion? Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah, they're absolute, you know, it's kilo calorie dosages mm -hmm. and, you know, you know, two or three times a day, mm -hmm. depending on age mm -hmm. group and so forth. But yes, doesn't require cooking, no hot water mm -hmm. necessary. You can be in the most difficult of the most difficult places and, you know, it's safe for consumption yes. right away. You know, still in all, um, some places haven't had this and food that shows up in a square packet, you know, can seem weird and strange mm -hmm. and, you know, there's education involved. Um, and I think that's one of the things that'll be critical as ready-to-use foods beyond even this, you know, are part of the, you know, products used to nourish the world, our, you know, understanding of nutrition, this is all linked, the diplomacy that will be necessary to engage in the discussions that help people understand what food like that can mean for a child's, you know, brain and body. I, I want to ask you to, to go a little bit further on that point and the point you, you raised earlier about the conversations that you had in Ethiopia, because getting people to accept new kinds of food and to take this on board takes sort of a lot of conversation and dialogue. And I wanted to ask you to just share some of the, the, the types of conversations you had to get the government on board and to uh, get farmers on board to working on this process with you. Okay. 
Well, I'll turn to Tara about the farmers, but I would say from our side, it was quite interesting actually because Josette and I had traveled to Ethiopia and had had a conversation with Prime Minister Meles at one point where she was describing for him this chickpea-based product and pulled it out of her bag as I just did here. And um, he said, you know, we grow, we grow chickpeas. We would like to produce that here. Now this was almost like a year before I had met Derek in the lobby. But when we had that conversation, you know, I was able to say to Derek, and I know the Prime Minister is keen on, you know, his making this stuff here, you know, which was part of what allowed us, you know, to get excited about this. Um, and then we had several subsequent meetings. I can't remember all of them, but Josette and I met with the Prime Minister two more times following. And then when we went to Addis Ababa, I think Tara, you were there with Derek and myself and others. We met with the Prime Minister again and with the head of the transition government, and, uh, and uh, who is coincidentally also the uh, Secretary of Agriculture. Um, but part of the challenge is really permeating the government, you know, all the way down. And, you know, governments are big places. And as we know well here from the U.S., you know, you can be best friends with a best friend of, you know, the president's, you know, cousin. And be missing a critical piece of information, you know, one agency over that's fundamental to the decision you're discussing. So, but I think Tara mentioned it earlier and she's quite right. Now that the government is seeing already that yields are almost doubling in these pilot projects, so they're seeing the fruits of the investment, it's really, you know, beginning to, to take root. So the conversations in those earliest days on the ground in Addis Ababa weren't so much about how do we break through to the government. The Prime Minister had arranged mm -hmm. it. We had mm -hmm. all the meetings and we had the buy-in. It's sustaining it over time, you know, at the working level. And I think positive results and a feedback loop, you know, are your best friend, you know, when you're doing that. So I just wanted to mention, because Nancy mentioned this a couple of times, and the, the sort of the other piece of this, of this project has been uh, an agriculture pilot that we undertook in, in uh, last year. And uh, there we worked directly with farmers, both with commercial farmers as well as, as well as with smallholder farmers. And we really had the opportunity then to interface with technical experts from the Ministry of Agriculture uh, locally in Ethiopia. And, um, and we also worked with the in in Ethiopian Institute of Agricultural Research. One commercial farmer in particular, and I think, Nancy, you mm. met him as well, but he, he runs a, a small farm, a, a small commercial farm in Ethiopia called Omega Farms. His How big is, is a small commercial farm? It's, it's only 20 hectares. Wow. So that is small. Uh, mm. so, and he, he is one yeah. of the smaller commercial yeah. farmers there, but he was truly dedicated. And, and you know, this was a, his name is Daniel Gad. He is an... He was a former AT&T executive who moved back and sort of set up this business almost as a hobby, but partly you know, as a commercial business, but partly also to, to start working with smallholder farmers and, uh, and have some social impact and bring positive social impact back to his own country. And so he, he, he in particular really uh, embraced the vision of this project and has been a, a tremendous resource for PepsiCo in helping to manage the farm demonstrate to his outgrowers the benefits of, of uh, adopting the best act, uh, best practices that we have introduced into commercial into farming in Ethiopia, and um, one thing that we've always heard from uh, from the farmers, from the uh, executives that we worked with, from the Ministry of Agriculture is that chickpea is really at the heart of Ethiopian culture, mm -hmm. and. So we really, you know, it, it, was, it was fortuitous, but we really seem to have hit the nail on the head with this one commodity. Mm -hmm. It's not a big commercial crop for Ethiopia. Only 20% yes. of it is exported. Right. Mm -hmm. But 80% of it is consumed locally, and it's uh, mm -hmm. a, an integral part of the diet. And so that really mm -hmm. affords us an opportunity to develop a nutritious product that people will immediately take to. They will understand the benefits of it because it's very much a part of their culture. And, and that, to me, also speaks to right. how wonderful this partnership is because it, it and, and the Prime Minister obviously saw this yes, immediately as well, did. that this is, you know, while, while the overall goals and objectives 
are clearly laid out and, and are obviously aimed to meet the agricultural needs of the country as well as the nutritional needs of the population, it also, at a, at a, a very deep cultural level, it really meets uh, their objectives. Um, so it, it really was a very nice coming together of all these different elements. And it's something that you can't discount, you know, right. from, from the perspective of a, of, a, of, a, of a, uh, a consumer goods company, that's really important. You mm -hmm. have to get that product right. And, uh, and I think this product is really going to be the right, right thing right. for Ethiopian consumers. And those were some of the exciting conversations on, on the ground, too, now that I'm playing back in my head that uh, as they were saying how <coughs> cool it would be to produce this in their own country. I think that's going to be one of the waves of the future with uh, you know, products at all levels, is that people want to produce their own and there's a real pride factor there. And we were testing that and in fact the product that we produced in Pakistan we called Wawa Mum, which was based on the local language and you know it meant it tastes good and it was very well received but of course you wouldn't want you know Pakistan's language in Ethiopia and we were playing around with calling it Shimbra Mum, which was an Amharic for chickpea yeah. and we tested a couple of things and we t I had you know our graphics person quickly assemble something and we showed it around and we haven't really concluded those discussions, but one thing we sensed right away, you know, to, to build on what Tara's saying, is that there's such a pride in, one, the chickpea, it's a known and loved, beloved food, but two, producing your own, manufacturing your <coughs> own, you know, making your own, that's empowering. So, you know, that's part of what's exciting about this partnership, too. If it really succeeds to its fullest potential, it won't just be Ethiopia producing it, but you know we've talked about other countries producing their own. You know, as we would move across Africa, so you know, quite exciting. Can I just ask, as, as a point of information, you're using this type of product in some of the other uh, emergency situations in the Horn of Africa and in other places currently? Well, we're not using a lot of it. In a, you know, yes, the answer is yes. We do sometimes use it. But you have to, you know use it, what is it? As I mentioned, there are different formulations for mm -hmm. treating and for supplementary. One of the critical issues, and this is a fascinating discussion for the world in the humanitarian space, is to what extent will we use these more nutritious foods that are being developed? So you've got two problems right now. One, you don't have the ability to scale production. So when a huge emergency happens, like the earthquake in Haiti, e even if donors were willing to pay for it, and it's more expensive than other interventions, you can't get it. So that's part of what we wanted to do here, is let's develop capacity. But then second, um, it is more expensive to use this super nutritious mm -hmm. food than to use some other things like that we regularly use. Corn soya blend uh, is what we often use. It's a sort of like a corn meal, and that requires water, and you cook it, and it has protein, and it's nutritious, not as effectual as this, but certainly better than nothing. And so there are interesting debates about do you reach more people with something that's somewhat less nutritious or fewer people with something that's much more nutritious. These are discussions the world has to engage in. We are a 100% voluntarily funded organization. So we don't call these shots ourselves. The donors call them on, on our behalf. Um, <clears throat> but we decided here and our partnership that PepsiCo is funding the first million dollars worth of this and will create the capacity, the manufacturing capacity, the momentum, the understanding, the, you know, the, the t all the testing and all the requirement for this to roll, you know, if there is demand. And those were fascinating discussions too because I made clear early on to PepsiCo and of course they're smarter business people than we are, so it didn't take a lot of persuading, but the price point would be critical. Um, mm -hmm. That, in other words, not, not because I say so, but because UN rules rightly require that NGOs in the United Nations go to the lowest bidder. So if we produced something that was wonderful and cool and everyone loved, but it was more, too expensive, it would become irrelevant. PepsiCo has really done, you know, excellent work to make that come in right at that price point where we will, you know, hit that target. So again, we've created the potential for this to really go. And there will be some uncontrolled variables and some controlled variables that determine whether we realize that potential.
So, so then it's the idea that you develop manufacturing potential, you develop production potential so that you can kind of, it maybe not switch on and off, but you can kind of have manufacturers switch back and forth between producing emergency packets and then maybe products for the local market. So you've got so you've got different well, products that manufacturers can do. No, I understand your your question. You know, some of these things will be determined. How many different products mm -hmm. will we have? We're starting off with one product, got it. a okay. supplementary product um, that will be used. Yes, it certainly could be used across the Horn of Africa, and the World Food Program could and would be willing to use it. Current rules and regulations we can program and would program this mm -hmm. in the situation to prevent malnutrition in the case of a drought. There are now 13 you know, million hungry people you know, across the Horn of Africa, who, who, and many of them are children and in the demographic that would really benefit from this. So we would expect you know, to be able to use it. But the, this is interesting from a business perspective, so this is what we're talking about. Yeah. It does become a little bit of a chicken and egg mm -hmm. situation because PepsiCo has been rightly asking us, how much of this stuff are you going to use? And you know, we would, you know, from a programmatic perspective, we can give numbers. We know how many hungry people are in the horn. We know how many of them are children in the demographic to receive the food and so forth. But the piece we don't know mm -hmm. is what funding will be like from donors. So we haven't been able to give the same kind of promise to PepsiCo that another you know, commercial partner would. And, but we've worked round and round that. And I think we've come to a place where we've set up the potential. And we know we'll have some demand. We'll program this. You know, we'll pilot this. But you know, this is one of the reasons the partnership is so cool. Mm -hmm. Is <clears throat> I can't tell you exactly right. how this will unfold. Right. right. Well, and you don't. You know, there's going to be demand. You mm -hmm. just you cannot possibly predict mm -hmm. exactly what your demand will right. be from right. year to year. That's right. exactly right. Yeah. And then from the local manufacturer's perspective, it then becomes really important to diversify mm -hmm. how they use mm -hmm. the raw materials that they would use for right. this product, so that. In lean times, when there is no demand or where there's limited demand for this product, they'll still have the opportunity to produce other products that could be chickpea based as well. Right. And that could be a commercial product right. for them. So they, they right. would sell directly into the market. Right. And that's, uh, I mean, we're hoping that eventually we'll be able to build capacity, not perhaps not just of one local manufacturer, but right. multiple. Right. And that would really benefit both the World Food Program and UNICEF and other uh, relief agencies, but also those manufacturers, right? And, and it's, ultimately and it's, the consumers. Yeah, and it's and early it's days, so this is this is all unfolding even as we speak. So these are very exciting things. I think um, one thing I wanted to ask you about a little bit more, um, Tara. You mentioned that PepsiCo is at its heart an agricultural company. You have to have high quality production at the right amount at the right times right. in order to make all the products that you make. Um, but we also know that you can't fix the problem by throwing seeds at it. Right. You can't just raise production by having better seeds or a bunch more seeds. So I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about how your agronomists, how your ag folks are actually helping to teach farmers how to farm better, to increase production, and what, that, what that's actually going to look like when you're working on the ground. Right. Uh, you've hit the nail on the head again. I mean, I think that the Ethiopian Institute for Agricultural Research, for example, has for years done very um, innovative research um, together with ICRISAT and other agencies on developing the right hybrid seeds for Ethiopian conditions, high yield seeds, mm -hmm. drought resistant seeds. And they've had fairly limited success in getting farmers to adopt those seeds and, and grow those seeds and, and, and be able to then produce higher uh, yields of chickpeas. So the first thing that we did when we went in with our agronomists was uh, work in partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ethiopian Institute for Agricultural Research, identify the right inputs for farmers, and then work directly with the farmers to understand, both understand from them and learn from them what are the challenges, the particular challenges that they face, but also then introduce to them new ideas, such as you know I was mentioning to you earlier, uh, simply instead of broad scattering the seeds, growing the crop in rows. Growing the crop in rows actually allows them to see better how the crop is growing mm -hmm. and manage the weeds, mm -hmm. manage each of the plants, and, and monitor progress as, uh, you know, as, the, as the crop takes root. 
And just that, I think the introduction just of that practice mm -hmm. has enabled farmers to uh, to really appreciate the crop a lot better. In, you know, normally under Ethiopian conditions, um, chickpea is a secondary crop. As I said earlier, it's, it's a, not a major commercial crop. And so they plant it in between seasons, in the secondary season. And it's, it's really mm -hmm. meant for domestic consumption, mm -hmm. so you get what you get. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, they began to see, well, this is, you know, this is, it's a, it's a better seed, it's a larger seed. I get better yield if I plant it in such in in such a condition, and uh, you know, and potentially even then with low cost irrigation systems, which we're now exploring, uh, we could enable them to um, not only increase the yields of uh, of this particular crop, but also plant a, a second crop. So they, there wouldn't be a fallow season, for example. Uh, so they're beginning to come up with some ideas themselves. The farmers themselves are really engaged and, and starting to introduce uh, new concepts and new ideas for themselves as well as for us. And so it's, a, it's been a real exchange of ideas. Very, uh, very exciting and very rewarding to work with these farmers. Um, so I, I think that you know, with, with this sort of interaction, we can really take agricultural production to the next level. And that's significant for the Ministry of mm -hmm. Agriculture. Yeah, they, they are very interested in the nutritious product that we will eventually be using from these chickpeas, mm -hmm. using the chickpeas as raw material. But they're also very, very interested in right. the opportunities for right. expanding exports. Right. And as you know, India is a huge market mm -hmm. and, an, and as yet an unmet market for, uh, for chickpeas. Mm -hmm. So, so th that, that in its, itself is, is bringing a lot of interest from USAID, mm -hmm. from the Ethiopian government, as well as potentially from other partners mm -hmm. as well. Are farmers buying the seeds or do they have a loan program? For the pilot, they didn't buy the seeds. Buy we actually okay. donated okay. the seeds to them. That's an important But for aspect. the next yep. phase, that's a great question mm -hmm. because we would like the farmers to have some buy-in. Mm -hmm. so, so if they're convinced that this is going to work, we would like them to be able to provide some financing up front uh, to buy the seeds. And that then brings in other commercial partners, mm -hmm. such as banks, mm -hmm. uh, that might be interested in, in providing microloans to the farmers. So all of this is still very much in flux, and we're mm -hmm. still having these discussions. But I think what's been critical over the last year, and it's been a very fast year, yeah. right, Nancy? Yeah. Um, what's been critical <laughs> is that the activities that we've undertaken on the ground have really generated a lot of interest from the farmers all the way up to the government and, and to international NGOs. And USAID, I should mention, is an implementing partner yes, as well on the ground, correct? It is. Um, I, th I think one of, the, one of the issues with Feed the Future and U.S. food security efforts is that ag development takes so long to unfold. And, and it's really, I think, a point of concern when you think about sustaining the efforts of the past couple of years in standing up Feed the Future and getting the program started, that if we don't see quick results, you know, it's really hard to go back and say, this program's working, we need to keep funding it. So I think this is an unusually powerful program because it kind of establishes a right now uh, success story of this type of partnership, <coughs> public-private partnership, um, that actually has some immediate results. If you've already seen a one and a half or doubling of production, mm -hmm. you can see how things are starting to get, uh, to get moving. It's really a powerful example of what can happen if you start working on the issue. And I wondered if, if you wanted to comment a little bit uh, on that sort of how this partnership is, is helping through this bridge phase to demonstrate some results. Yeah. Well, I have to say, <clears throat> we have de demonstrated a lot of results in a short period of time. I was laughing earlier with Tara because we were talking about the challenges and lessons learned, and she was saying it's taken longer than you know, we would have liked. And it, it has, because we're all impatient people. But <clears throat> I think it was November, literally, you know, a year and a couple of months ago that Derek and I were first talking of this idea in the lobby. In the year that's passed since, uh, you know, we've had the heads of every organization involved, you know, sign an MOU. We went to Addis Ababa the next month with our senior teams. I went taking my team, Derek went, he brought Tara and others, including significantly and importantly, people from the business arm of PepsiCo. Mm -hmm. We brought in our 
country director to be for Ethiopia, who was currently the country director in the DRC. We also brought in our senior liaison with the uh, African Union. So we really, from the earliest days, you know, took that all seriously. And now, you know, what we see is, you know, you've had your first results on the pilot yields, which were nearly double. That was just, you know, weeks ago. Um, and we are on track to have the, I don't have the packet, but whoever has it somewhere, rolling off the product line this summer. And, you know, we will, and we have, you know, have been chosen the, the manufacturers. So the government is seeing the potential and frankly, we're seeing the potential. I mean, I think people lose perspective. It's not only the government, and the public, and outsiders who have to remain energized. It's the partners themselves. As someone who manages all the private sector partnerships for the World Food Program, and I, I will be bold and brazen in saying, and I, I think we are really the UN leader in public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you, you know, part of the trick is keeping yourself energized when the partnerships inevitably hit bumps and challenges mm -hmm. and so forth. So the results that we're seeing are invigorating to ourselves mm -hmm. and our team. You know, the people who do the day in, day out hard work, like Kai Young, who's, who's here in the audience. I mean, you know, a lot of people are, are working hard. So I, I do think these successes, you know, matter. And, um, we haven't done a lot of communications around this, uh, but this is the kind of thing I'd like to do, is engage in, you know, not launches and, and you know, but deep down discussions about, you know, how these, how these things work and to solicit other incoming ideas and to ask the hard questions. Because you asked a really great question about, I think, you know, the fact that this this partnership actually encompasses both the immediate term need and impact that we can have with the relief nutrition product, but at the same time it sets you up for long-term success mm -hmm. in terms of agricultural mm -hmm. outputs. And that's what partners like the mm -hmm. Ministry of Agriculture mm -hmm. and USAID are also looking for. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what's wonderful about yeah. this, that you can see both the immediate impact that you can have with this project but then you can also uh, project out yes, 10 years right. from now and see how this could be transformational. So ultimately, I think, Nancy, you and maybe Josette have also mentioned this, that ultimately you'd like to create a situation in Ethiopia where this product is not needed Absolutely. Any, anymore. Right. And it's a commercial product instead. Yeah. No, I, I would agree. The World <laughs> Food Program has been a real leader on, on partnerships. And can you just describe the shift in public and private funding you've had over, you, over the past several years? Um, well, we are an organization, so we're entirely voluntarily mm -hmm. fundraised. Our budget is around $3.7 billion. The private contributions are still a very small percentage of our overall contributions when I came. We were raising around $20 million. Last year, we raised around $156 million from the private sector. So it, it's grown exponentially. It's still a, a, you know, a minor part of our total funding. But what is so exciting are, is the nature of a, a partnership like this goes so far beyond the financial contribution. Mm -hmm. PepsiCo has been generous, and the money is important, but it isn't the pre predominant thing here. It's a way of thinking and really working with the private sector to take advantage of expertise and create synergy and momentum and bring fresh problem solving. Because one of the things I love about the job that I have is that <clears throat> philanthropy is really changing now. And I think people are appreciating a couple of factors are coming together at the same time. One, we all know that the governments have sort of hit their limit on spending. It's not just the United States, but Europe and others that are um, at maximum capacity, less inclined to just hand money over, you know, to others. And so it's, a, and at the same time, the companies, as we discussed, are moving into these markets. And so where philanthropy used to be, the company sort of did the nice thing to get on the front page and get credit for doing some corporate social good. Now the companies have a complete vested stake in solving these big global social problems because in these, these are their consumers and their suppliers and every other thing. So getting it right 
And some people don't like that. They think, oh gosh, you know, the companies, it's in their selfish interest. I love it because you want it to be in their selfish interest. So yes, they're doing good. I've engaged with enough of these leaders in these companies to see that they care about the people and the problems as much as any of us do. But yes, they've got the additional incentive of the dollar. You know, let's just be real. That's a powerful incentive. And um, I think that sets up real, you know, positive momentum. And, um, and what I'm seeing is that even in the short time I've been at the World Food Program, five years, you know, when I came, you had to be very careful how you said what I just said. You know, this mm -hmm. could really mm -hmm. freak some people out. <laughs> Now people are understanding it and realizing that, you know, the fact that companies, it's in their financial self-interest as well as their humanitarian self-interest and the good of the world to solve these problems. It, you know, people are less afraid to talk about this and then it gives, creates the freedom and space to build more dynamic, exciting partnerships. And I think one thing that we hear over and over from companies uh, that's very clear is that the, the cash is a very small piece of the actual partnership. There's an enormous amount of technical skill. In your case, you're, you're agronomists, you've got food scientists, you've got commitment, you've got a big name brand that can mobilize a lot of support and interest. That, that, that writing a check is the tip of the iceberg for what you actually contribute to the partnership. Um, but but the, some of the challenges are very, very real. And I want to just um, we'll open to audience questions after I ask you both just to talk a little bit about what are some of the challenges and bumps of the partnerships that you have encountered. And how do you kind of get through those? Because partnerships can be really hard. And we want to, one thing we're trying to do is put together some tips and roadmaps for how to manage some partnerships. I want to hear from you both what, what you've learned. Well, the, the good thing about a partnership, and I, you know, this is an African proverb, right? If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with somebody. And in this case, we really want to go far. We want to have long-term, far-reaching impact. And it, while, you know, it's, we talked about this before as well, that, you know, there's a real cultural difference mm -hmm. between the private sector and, and governments and international NGOs and agencies like the World Food Program. We work at a different pace. We have different roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We have different expectations. And so, you know, we, Nancy, you're right. I mean, we, we've worked tremendously fast. Uh, given the nature of this partnership. Uh, but there have been challenges along the way. There have been misunderstandings. There have been multiple conversations going back and mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we've worked through all of those challenges. And we've worked you know, through dialogue. Um, but what's, what's been wonderful about the partnership is that there has been dedication from the top all the way through the ranks. Mm -hmm. And so while we weren't always understanding each other in terms of you know, what's, what's the expectation, what's the time frame, um, who's responsible, mm -hmm. um, we, we still managed to work through all of those details because we had this open dialogue and this commitment to see the objective and, and see us through to the objective and see success. Um, it's been the same for us in terms of the agricultural work as well. We weren't always on the same page with our commercial farmer. We weren't always on the same page with the smallholder farmers, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Agricultural Transformation Agency. There were many players involved uh, on all of those fronts. Uh, but I think what's, what's important is early on in the partnership, set out the goals and objectives, mm -hmm. and then work towards them, and, and identify the right sort of people within the, within the company, within the institution, who can take those objectives forward. Great. And Nancy? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, well, I uh, agree with all that. And I have to say, you know, relationships are critical. I mean, one of the reasons, because we have good relationships across the organization at a good level, when misunderstandings do arise, and I can just give one, I got one call from, I can't even remember who on my staff saying, but, you know, PepsiCo's telling our country office that, you know, we have to buy the chickpeas. And I said, well, I'm certain that isn't the case. You know what I mean? But then you realize that meanwhile this has taken root in the country program, you know, mm -hmm. confirming their worst fear, you know, that, you know, the company. 
And you know, you, you just drill right down and clear it up. But one of the things we did is we decided to pull all the players to our headquarters and bring them together for a conversation and just say, OK, let everybody surface doubts, concerns, you know, what isn't working. And you know, because you know, we're a far-flung organization working in 74 countries, you know, headquartered <laughs> in Rome, PepsiCo's based in the United States, Ethiopia clearly is in Africa. So you have a lot of players across different time zones and different locations. And we pulled everybody in for a conversation. I think it's critical to have buy-in from your country office. You know, so often what happens in public-private partnerships is you, you know, develop them, you know, in the public, in the private sector space, and the and the country office is viewed as the implementer. They then just take orders. So you hatch this high-minded business deal, and then you superimpose it on people who are feeding hungry people day in, day out. And it can be difficult. So we establish the early on buy-on. But sometimes what happens is you, you move beyond and you forget about that. So the, the communication link with the country office, with the country operation is critical. And I think our team has been very good. Of course, the country offices usually want more capacity because mm -hmm. a partnership like this does put weight on them. And the partner's very generous. PepsiCo's funded three positions and you know, given a cash grant and doing all these other interesting things that you hear about, none of which are underappreciated. From the country office perspective, they need more. You know, they need more human beings on the ground to implement. And so it's always you know, a challenge of how do you create as much capacity as you can and have reasonable expectations so that you're not taking a disproportionate amount of time and energy at the country level. That, I think, is a challenge across any public-private partnership ever that we've done. The one other I'd table uh, that we talked about earlier is <coughs> the gut, you know, sometimes you can be in at too senior a level. You know, in this partnership, not too senior a level, but so senior that you assume it's going to be a given. The prime minister wants it. Indra Nui wants it. Josette Sheeran wants it. Therefore, you know, it will happen. No. You know, you have to communicate effectively at all levels. There are many different people involved who may not even understand what these, you know, influential, important people want. So the buy-in at the top level creates a momentum and a synergy, and it's a very critical door opener for government, no question. Um, but you can't stop there, and you can't take that seniority for granted, you know, that it will go down. It's a day in, day out, week in, week out, you know, challenge to involve all the players, you know, to make sure people feel heard, understood, and listened to. We haven't always gotten that right. You know, you, you get busy. And you take your eye off the ball, and suddenly you realize, you know, misunderstandings, you know, develop, and you have to go back. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just life, right? You know, I, I mean, even across things beyond public-private. So communication, fundamental. So as, as we talked, you really have highlighted I, probably three things. One is that you have to have strong leadership and strong message from your leadership. Second is having a clear goal. Mm -hmm. is essential because then you, you know what you're driving toward. And then third is just constant communication up, down, and across the board. So I, I think it's not fair for me to keep asking you questions when I know our, our audience wants to ask you some questions. So I'll open to, um, to questions. What we're going to do is probably take a two or three at a time, ask you just to identify yourself and your affiliation, and ask a brief question. No lectures, please. OK. Right here, we'll start here. And the microphone's going to come to you. Good morning. My name is Kara George from Humanitas Global Development. And I had a question for, I guess, all three of you. Um, you mentioned that taste and knowing the, knowing the ingredients in the product are important for, for the population to accept it well. Um, but given that you know, it comes in a package that may not be so familiar, how do you involve your educational component to then garner trust? Okay. Thank Good. you. Let's take, there was a hand in the back over here. That was a very good, short, concise question. Thank you. Model that. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Jorn with a company called ROI3. Uh, this is for um, Tara and Nancy. Uh, you mentioned communications is critical um, to your effort. Uh, the growth of cell phones in all areas, particularly in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, has been enormous. How, 
how are you using cell phones to communicate with your producers and also with your intended audience as far as the nutritious value of the products? Okay, The consumers, great. in effect. Thank you. Uh, right here in front, and then next we'll go to the back. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Segura. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on job creation and entrepreneurship uh, through job creation. Um, I just want to thank you so much for your presentation. I'm initially from Kenya. How do you work with farmers or how do you fund or support the farmers who are in the rural areas who do more work? Is it a fair trade uh, funding or support to support themselves on long term or how do you do it? And are you look, the other question is, are you looking to extend to other African countries? And if so, are you going to use the same model into manufacturing or those people could still get manufacturers like me out of other countries and sell to the World Food Program? So thank you so much. Great, thank you. I'm gonna like stop there and uh, whoever wants to go first. Do you wanna take the education? Yeah. Component? Yeah, just, you know, quickly on, on those three points, you know, a great question about the taste, like, you know, what do you do? You know, of course, you know, when we, when we use this under any circumstance, well, for one thing, in the Pakistan floods, when you're in a critical situation, you may not have time to do that. But in this instance, this product will be piloted among 40,000 children in <laughs> Ethiopia. And so, you know, there will be conversation. Our program officers are very careful about introducing the product, explaining to, you know, parents about, you know, how it's used and how it's made, that it's made from a local chickpea crop and so forth. And that's measured and mm -hmm. all part of the pilot. And the pilot, you know, the results of the pilot will be shared, of course, you know, with government and everything, you know, as we take decisions about the pace and rate with which, you know, to expand. Um, I could say many cool things on cell phones. We're not using that. We aren't, and I think Tara is, so she can touch on that, but we're using tel cell phones enormously in our work uh, when, to, to deliver vouchers in places where you know, there may not be food. It's a very exciting space and one that we are working on across Sub-Saharan Africa, maybe for another conversation. And to your point, only to say, um, for you about the rural farmers in Ethiopia, but I think it's important to say the World Food Program, we have a program called P4P, Purchase for Progress, where we are working with smallholder rural farmers in 21 countries around the world, uh, many of them in Africa, and the whole idea is we're trying to use our demand for pulses, rice, other products that are grown to you know, create and develop best practices so we give farmers a guaranteed contract for purchase. We partner with others including FAO and many others to provide the training. How do you, because a lot of the smallholder farmers produce a crop but we can't legally buy it because it's not the right grade. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing the training. How do you dry a, a pulse or a bean? How do you sort it and, you know, separate out the broken ones and so forth? And we've had just unbelievable success helping be the demand engine pull to producing grade A commercially purchasable, you know, foodstuffs from smallholder farmers around the world, connecting farmers to markets. It's a very dynamic, exciting project funded by Bill Gates and the Buffett, uh, the Gates Foundation and the Howard Buffett Foundation. And, uh, and we've talked about partnering with that, you know, through, you know, with the PepsiCo project. P for P, we could spend yeah. another two hours yeah. on. Definitely, yeah. it's a fantastic program. Tara. So on, just, just on that, yes, exactly. We've been talking with P for P within the uh, World Food Program. And, um, and typically, you know, across the world, when we work with smallholder farmers or with, when we work with any farmers, really, we work through contracts. So we do contract farming. Um, you know, in the US, it was, it's largely with commercial farmers. In countries like China, India, Brazil, we tend to work with smallholder farmers. Um, and we anticipate pretty much the same approach in, um, in Ethiopia as well as in other sub-Saharan African countries um, where we set up contracts directly with farmers and, um, and, um, and buy their uh, produce, so provide market guarantees for them. Um, the cell phone usage is, is an interesting question. We, we do, of course, communicate with farmers um, uh, on cell phones in many, many parts of the world. 
uh, particularly in developing countries where that's much more the norm than, uh, than any other form of communication. In Ethiopia, I think it's a little bit of a challenge yet because I think uh, the telecommunication sector in Ethiopia is not quite open, mm -hmm. and so it's um, it's a it's a little bit it, it's it's a, I would say it's a little bit in a different place compared with many other sub-Saharan African countries. But again, it's an issue that Prime Minister Milis is very much involved with and and dedicated to. So so um, we do anticipate a change uh, there. Um, uh, and finally, on the education component, that was a great question. Um, we actually, so in addition to the learnings that we will gain in partnership with the World Food Program in Ethiopia, we've also piloted other nutritional products for lower income consumers around the world. So in the Philippines, we have an iron fortified Quaker Oats product. In India, um, last year, we launched a very successful uh, snack as well as a biscuit, um, a cookie that's iron fortified and it is targeted mm -hmm. at adolescent girls. And, uh, and there's a big education component around that as well. So you know, there, was, there were videos that were generated, uh, there, there were uh, street plays. Uh, you know, we're working with um, research institutions and NGOs in India to ensure that that message reaches the appropriate consumers in India. So we'd love to bring some of the, those learnings as well to this, uh, to this partnership and, and expand upon that. Great. OK, for our next round of questions, model the questions in the set before. Those are excellent. We're going to start with a man in the, in the back who was raising his hand before. Hi, my name is George Day, and I'm a consultant here in town. Uh, nice. Thank you for the presentation. That was uh, fantastic. My question was actually very similar to the, the previous question, which is there's obviously a great humanitarian benefit to this, increasing local production. But the smallholder farmer is also a, a focus here as well, right, increasing their income. And uh, so, Tara, I think you actually sort of answered this question that you're setting a, a contract price or a guaranteed price with the farmers. But I'm interested in, is that also a goal of this, um, like it is for P4P, for P, that you'll improve the, the income level of these smallholder farmers? Okay. Uh, right in the front here. Thank you, for, thank you for the presentation. I'm myself from Ethiopia. So I know the price of uh, chickpeas used to be like uh, per quintal, like 100 kilogram would be like uh, before it's the 90s, you know? It's that less than 100 Ethiopian, which means equivalent to about 30 some dollars back then. Now the price is soaring because it's almost hitting about 700 something. It's, you cannot, <coughs> it's more than 2,000 person. Uh, so how this new, your innovative product will address that price because if you say, like uh, when Nancy mentioned, it's in the Horn of Africa, only 30 million uh, people are affected by this malnutrition. So the world, the, glo the world population is reaching almost seven, or almost reached seven billion. Out of that, like more than half of that lives under the poverty line. So this will be a big potential business for PepsiCo. Like I don't know if United Nations involves in the business. So how would you think like the future? It's a kind of Petroleum for me, like it kind of, it will be a big business. So, how would you address that global problem? So, food price is a big question. And then, if you can just hand your microphone to the woman on the edge, not really on the edge, just sitting on the edge. I think, thank you so much. My question actually is sort of. Could you just of comes say your name and affiliation? His. Yep. <laughs> My name is Megan. My question is of a personal nature, um, but I'm coming from Kamanic, so I can understand very well the point about humanitarian interests as well as financial interests, but I'm more interested in specifically what are Pepsi-Cola's more commercial interests? Is it sort of tapping into products for, that poor people can purchase themselves? Is it market research for the middle class? Is it selling this more to donors? What is the more commercial aspect of the partnership for you? Great, thanks. And then if you'll pass it right behind you to the woman in the purple stripes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Susan Vorkover. I'm um, with Meds and Foods for Kids. And I, oh, sorry. And um, I am just wondering what you're doing to identify organizations who are sort of maybe already doing something like this, but just on a much smaller scale. So doing the agricultural interventions in order to produce RUTFs, RUSFs, and what, and what you're doing to, to sort of see what's already out there. Okay. Tara, do you want to start with that round? Um, yeah, sure. Let me talk about um, improving the income level uh, of farmers that Jordan raised. Um, that's very much the, the objective of the agricultural work that we're, that we're undertaking. And, 
And this is particularly what has increased, in, in, uh, intrigued the Ministry of Agriculture and the Prime Minister. They are interested in improving the lot of smallholder farmers by introducing better hybrid seeds into the community and then, and then um, helping the farmers command better prices on the international market. Um, but that raises the question then of food prices. And as you, as you rightly mentioned, the price of chickpeas has actually been increasing um, over the last two years. However, in the last few months of last year, they actually started to settle down and actually drop beneath the level of, for example, soybeans in, uh, um, in Ethiopia. So actually, the World Food Program's uh, Purchase for Progress um, uh, unit is actually considering the possibility of buying chickpeas from farmers because that price has now stabilized considerably. Interestingly, in uh, you know, the last couple of weeks, we had conversations with the Ministry of Agriculture, particularly on that issue of food prices. And, uh, and they are keen to see the food prices, particularly for chickpeas, actually drop a little bit more so that more um, domestic consumers can have access to chickpeas. Um, that's actually great for PepsiCo as well. So that brings us to the question of uh, PepsiCo's commercial interests, right? So part of the interest, uh, and I say only part of the interest uh, for PepsiCo in the immediate term, is to diversify our source of chickpeas um, across the world. And Ethiopia is a great source of chickpeas. So it's the number one producer of chickpeas in Africa. So we, uh, we are particularly interested in um, in procuring chickpeas from Ethiopian farmers. So, so that would set up contract farming in Ethiopia for us. Uh, and then uh, exporting the raw chickpeas, so unprocessed chickpeas, to uh, our businesses in North America and in Europe. Uh, that's where we have immediate needs. However, in the longer term, we're also interested in setting up processing and manufacturing within Ethiopia so that Ultimately, we will be making products that are appropriate for Ethiopian consumers uh, in Ethiopia using those chickpeas. And that's a slightly longer term aspiration compared to what we would want for 2012, 2013, but it's very much within our sights. Nancy, yeah. comments from you. Yeah, I would just add on, on a couple of points. Hey, Jordan, good to see you. And um, while PepsiCo has a goal of getting the income of farmers up, uh, of chickpea farmers up, and I think we will see that happen, it's not one of the express goals of the partnership. You know, what we laid out for the partnership is to increase and improve yield, so to establish the supply chain with the yield, to, to, to develop this nutritious product and to make it available and to develop the manufacturing capacity. And then individual players, you know, have sub goals beyond that and clearly the government is quite keenly interested of course in you know establishing jobs getting the income up and I think that will be an exciting side benefit but the the sort of day job of our partnership is more fundamental to your very good point about you know well what about food prices and what effect will this have um, I think in the beginning, the <coughs> amount of supply we're talking about is sufficiently f small that, you know, just on a mathematic basis, you'll see that it won't have any impact on price. But it is true, absolutely, that, you know, it's, it's a force beyond this partnership, that people are appreciating the chickpea, they're seeing the nutritive value of it, it tastes good, and everybody likes it more. Westerners are eating more hummus, you know. Indians have always eaten, consumed a lot of chickpeas, but you know, population is big and growing there. So there's more demand for the chickpeas, so it's not surprising that prices will rise. We've seen a dip, but I think the overall trend line you know, will be modestly up. There, you know, it's a longer discussion about food prices more broadly. Um, but I think you know, the goal really is, uh, from my perspective, this is a personal view, not the World Food Program's view, you can't be about price control. You can't take these decisions on control. There's too many outside factors anyway. A drought or an export ban or any other thing can really throw a monkey wrench. But I think the goal for the world really should be to increase production of chickpea really worldwide because as you say, it's one of the few crops that actually enhances the you know, nutrients in the soil. It's super nutritious. It's a more um, <clears throat> efficient way of providing protein to people, you know, than meats and everything. So it's something that would just make sense in the broader macro perspective of how we feed the world. 
And then prices will rise and fall you know, in accordance with economic principles and supply and demand. We want to make sure, for sure, that as the World Food Program, we don't distort markets. And that's something we've given a huge amount of attention to in looking at Purchase for Progress. We have to be super careful, and we are. Um, and you know, it's hard to be a player as big as we are and never affect markets anywhere you know, at the margins, but we're super sensitive to that. Um, but in the big picture, you know, I think it's, it's beyond that. I think I'm going to relabel this session Ode to the Chickpea. <laughs> um, okay, I want to take one last round of questions and before we close up. I, I'm going to scoot over to this side of the room. Uh, Jerry Jensen in the front. Thanks. Jerry Jensen from Initiative for Global Development. I want to pick up on... Just hold it closer. I want to pick up on uh, Joanna's question about lessons learned and what advice you would give to other companies who are trying very hard to integrate development into their um, uh, base business. On the question of scaling, you know, when do you transition from pilot to scaling? I think there's a lively debate there in the agricultural mm -hmm. sector. Uh, a number of folks uh, talk about the importance of focusing on the pilot for long periods of time, and then others say you have to scale right at the beginning in order to do this right. I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Okay, that's a great question. And then there's a woman right behind you. Hi, um, Bridget Rallier, USAID Office of Food for Peace. Uh, I have a question about your model working with smallholder farmers and whether there was any effort to particularly target um, women smallholder farmers with this initiative. Okay, great. And then one last question. Let's the man on the end here. A little gender diversity. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Lamote. I'm from Haiti. Um, and I, my question is re regarding the planning for to facilitate soft to soft trading in terms of agricultural products uh, because there are certain countries that are more efficient at producing certain products than others, and so that is there sort of a macro planning to uh, help um, uh, increase the, uh, the yield uh, and, 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 and the usage of certain products from particular countries from south to south? Okay, let's uh, take those questions as our last round. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when do you scale? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's no right answer, but our intention would be to scale quickly. In other words, we know, we know already that this product, you know, works. And it will be interesting to see the acceptability in Ethiopia versus, you know, other countries that we've worked in. But it's not a brand new first time experience. And Again, you know, what will determine whether we scale are really the resources that become available, you know, both from private and from government sectors who are, you know, excited and, and ready to move to use this in nourishing that population. And frankly, the local, you know, the, the local governments, the national governments who, you know, will take decisions about, you know, whether to use this in their own public, you know, food distributions and other things. That's why I say the diplomacy and education around it, you know, becomes so important. Um, but I think that I would like to scale quickly, and we are positioned to scale mm -hmm. quickly if those other forces permit. Um, uh, to the food for peace about the women, I, you know, this partnership doesn't have a goal specifically of targeting women, um, and Tara can discuss maybe PepsiCo's view on that. I'll just say from the World Food Program's perspective. Uh, you know, women are absolutely fundamental. You know, they're doing 80% of the subsistence farming. And one of our frustrations as we've done uh, um, Purchase for Progress has been, in spite of the fact, for example, in Africa that most smallholder farmers are women, when you put together a program that uses trade associations and everything, we find disproportionate numbers of men coming in. And we've done uh, just an unbelievable amount of work with the Gates Foundation and others in our own gender unit trying to address that. It's difficult for complicated, you know, social reasons, but it's important. And I think, you know, I know that both organizations would like to include, you know, women, but we don't have specific partnership, you know, goals and incentives, you know, for that at this point. Um, and then <clears throat> to the question about the macro planning, 
Um, <coughs> you know, one thing that was fascinating and important about this partnership from the beginning is that uh, because Meles was interested and he hooked us up immediately with the head of the transition government who already had as its senior leader someone coming from the Gates Foundation who was very keenly interested in agriculture and production and all of that. There was from the earliest days at the government level macro planning that integrated the thinking of this you know, into the government's you know, transition program. Now I haven't followed all of that closely about how it's unfolded, but I know that in those meetings we did discuss that, so you, you might want to pick up there. Yeah, I, let me go back to the beginning because I think this is what's so exciting about this, uh, this partnership right now. You asked the question about you know, when to scale, and, and I think, Nancy, you're absolutely right. The, the time to scale is when all the partners are ready, coming around the table, and ready to invest. Mm -hmm. And um, that's exactly where we are right now. Now, I would say that it would have been foolhardy, at least from PepsiCo's perspective, to walk into Ethiopia and think that we could go to scale from day one because this was a new geography, geography for us. We didn't really understand how to operate in Ethiopia. We don't even have a, a physical PepsiCo entity in Ethiopia. We, we have a, a beverages company that has been there for 40 years, but we didn't have a foods production entity in Ethiopia. So um, you know, this was really new ground for us. And secondly, from the perspective of the partnership and its focus on under nutrition, this was also a relatively new space for us. And so we really needed to test the waters and understand what's the best way to take this forward. And, and now we have that learning in place, I would say, and we have such a great deal of enthusiasm and interest from diverse partners that um, now I think we are really poised for a, a pretty big expansion of this effort and really uh, you know, um, have some positive impact. Um, so I, I think we're ready to, to go to scale at this point. Um, on smallholder farmers and particularly on targeting women, that was a question that was raised right from the beginning and it was, um, it was perplexing in Ethiopia actually. We visited many farms right from the beginning and all you would ever see were the men. And they are even more so than in uh, you know, what you would expect to see on, on a typical farm in, in Kenya. You would often see the, the woman, and she, and she takes charge of the farm, and, and you interact directly with her. In, in Ethiopia, it's very, very different. The women are sort of hidden away. And I have no doubt that they are out there in the fields and working them. But, um, and you say no, so, so perhaps. And that, that explains it then. So we've never really seen any women out in the fields. And, uh, and so it, that has been definitely a challenge for us to interface directly with women and, uh, and work with them on this project. Um, and on the macro planning, I think um, that's definitely something that's very, very much of interest, as Nancy was saying, uh, with the prime minister all the way through. Um, and I think that there is definitely an interest from PepsiCo, from, uh, you know, from the perspective of uh, World Food Program, to see how we can take this type of partnership and expand it out to other regions, um, not just maybe in Sub-Saharan Africa, but to perhaps to other geographies as well. I think there, there is a tremendous need mm -hmm. across the globe. And, uh, and we did make a pledge, a very public pledge. Indra Nui made this pledge two years ago where one of our major goals is to address undernutrition and help to reach the, uh, you know, the two billion people who are really in need both of macronutrients mm -hmm. as well as micronutrients. And so we're exploring different ways in which we can do that. And, uh, and this partnership really affords us a, a wonderful, um, a pilot, a, a wonderful sort of model that we can base those efforts on. Well, I think we're getting to the, the end of our time, so I want to just wrap up with a few comments before we thank uh, everyone for joining us. First, um, this issue is ever, ever relevant and present. We know that we have a great deal of hunger right now in the Horn of Africa. We have rising hunger in the Sahel. We have a situation in North Korea that's undoubtedly going to 
to be terrible. And so hunger is always with us, and we appreciate all of the efforts that World Food Program does in helping the US and other governments to, to, to reach these places that we may not be otherwise able to reach. Um, the second comment I wanted to make is that we're producing a number of reports at CSIS that I think would be of interest. Um, Dan Rundy has authored a specific report on the future of partnerships that is great. Um, I'd recommend it to you. It's on our website. We've just released uh, this week a piece on partnerships to build African scientific capacity around agriculture to get to some of the agronomy questions that we addressed. That's also on our website, and we'll have a number of other reports out. So please look for those and come back to us. We'll have. Uh, another session on February 1st. February 1st, we're going to have a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps. We've got um, Representative Petri, Representative Farr, and Representative uh, Garamande joining Aaron Williams, the Peace Corps Director, to really talk about the legacy of the Peace Corps and its impact on U.S. smart power. So I hope you'll join us for that too. But I would say today, it. Um, like it takes two to tango, it takes a great audience to make an event, and what a sophisticated group of people we've had here, and a couple of great speakers. So thank you for joining us, and thanks to our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you.